Okay. We are recording now. <laughs> so that was too bad. That would have been a great thing to have in there for a sound bite. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh I'm well. sure up with it again. <laughs> <laughs> so we're up to 14 people and it is 102. This could be very quick. This could be jam packed. It's all up to you guys and how many questions you ask. So a bit of housekeeping. Use the chat if you don't want to um, talk. Raise your hands because we'll notice it. We have Kaylee Pets on board and she's going to be looking, keeping an eye on the chat. Um, and um, this is going to be a fair bit more interactive. Um, if you're not talking, though, make sure that you're um, um, muted because the sound can get quite distracting. And if you're having any broadband issues, make sure you shut off your video for sure. And if you need to, just shut off all the video um, and um, you can listen to the disembodied voices. Um, and I will put up once again. Um, I'm going to put up the um, link to how to get closed captioning on if you are interested in that. All right, so I'm going to start my talk. I'll introduce who's here to chat with everybody. There's myself. I'll be the main talker. Kaylee's our background person. Sandra, our, our GIS guru. She's moved up to Guru now with the work she's done. Um, <laughs> she um, will be here to troubleshoot. And Jack, I believe, will be here for a while as well. He's not up yet. Um, and so I will get started. Where is my, as always, I have to find my PowerPoint show and get it started here. All right, that one. All right, so the second half is all about using the apps in the field. And um, likely I will go over this too fast. I don't think any adult learner, we have a need to have both visual learning and hands-on learning. So I don't think sitting through a single webinar is good for any of us, but you will have this and you will have the protocol and you will have um, Sandra's excellent module video videos, which I think many of you have seen already. So um, I think there's a lot to work with there. So to, to move right in, we're going to talk about setting up and how to pre-plan your safety, your personal safety, how to prioritize survey locations, how to conduct the assessments, trail types, uh, pretty minorly, we're not going to get too much into that. Some challenges and a little bit on reviewing the data, not too much on reviewing the data because you really guys don't really have much responsibilities once you're out of the field. And if I need to slow down or if you have any questions on a specific topic, go ahead and ask. If we get too far behind, I might stop that. But we, we um, want to keep this as interactive as possible. So when you um, start up, the first thing you got to do is you got to download your two apps and the modules are great to help you with that. Then you spend the first little while until at least the, the third workshop, which we decided this morning was going to be Wednesday night at 730. You'll spend that time just going out and testing it a bit around home. Make sure you figure out how to load the data to the, to the server. Um, because that's the biggest thing. If you do all this work and you don't get the data uploaded, you're gonna be frustrated. We're all gonna be frustrated. So this is a good time to test that. Um, likely on the weekend, Sandra's gonna go through and clear out all the old data so that on the last Monday of the month, I think that's the planning right now, but we can discuss it. You guys can go in and start entering real data. You're going to see as we go through that we need team members of at least two in a group. And that's because of the kind of app work that we're doing. We're going to, uh, before you get out in the field, you have to set up your time and your dates and your locations where you want to survey and connect with your team. You got to figure out what equipment you needed. And there's a short list. Some of them you may or may not want to use. And remember to do a survey, you need at least two, t two phones or two mobile devices with you to do it properly. So as I mentioned before, there is a minimum quality operating system you need for your Android or your um, Apple product, and that's six Marshmallow or later for Androids, and iOS version 13 or later for um, your Apple. Um, 
And um, if you have those projects, it's not a problem. The is no cost to you guys to use. Um, and it, this works for both the Survey123 and the Quick Capture. We got two different apps and there's no cost to you guys at all to upload those apps into your system. You will also need internet access at times. You don't need them in the field, but you'll need it at times. And I, we don't know how far the battery's gonna last, whether it's hot or cold and, and how many captures that you take or your storage pace on your phone. From what Sandra and I have been testing out, uh, most phones will do quite well. And you can take, a, I think Sandra told me she took a hundred different assessments one day and, and over four hours and it handled it beautifully. So that will be something that each one will have to find out what works for themselves as we go. Um, now, what you need to do to make sure your app's working. You do the appendices of the protocol. And if anybody wants me to go over those later, I can pull them up and show you. Um, there is a protocol for downloading survey one, two, three, and the two forms the general information form and the trail assessment form for survey one, two, three, as well as a protocol for, for downloading um, the app for Arc, ArcGIS Quick Capture and the one form for it. So you wanna take those and you wanna get them on your phone, log in and test drive the app. So I guess this is where I mentioned that not every person we'll see, receive a login for quick capture. Um, Sandra feels that we can manage one login per team and they will get access to the quick capture and you'll later on see a map that they will also have access to. Um, when you're surveying, don't worry about mistakes, especially in this I, I would say right now when you're doing your testing, worry about the mistakes. If you put anything in that form, Make sure it ends up in the map, even if that means calling and asking. Um, uh, you want to make sure that those um, uploads are happening because we are going to delete all these mistakes probably about Saturday or Sunday or whenever Sandra has the time before we get started on main trail capture. So by making sure and practicing and making sure mistakes happen and things get in and you find out what doesn't work, that's the biggest thing. If we resolve it doesn't work now, it's much better than later. So you can assume no data is kept for now until we tell you otherwise. And the ones who have the quick capture logins will be able to review the map and see where the mistakes happen. And there's lots of ways to ask questions. You can ask us by email or Discord or in the next meeting. And if we decide we have, wanna have uh, more regular meetings or a coffee house set up or something like that, I'm game to do that for people. If we find a day that we want to get together every once a week or every couple of weeks, uh, I'm willing to, to um, accommodate that as well. So um, what about the teams? Um, we feel that you need a minimum of two members to survey each team one per mobile device. The, the technologies in these two apps are different enough. You want one person using Quick Capture alone and one person using Survey123 alone. Um, so we're gonna call those two people team member S and team member Q. Now, if you have more team members, you can split it up differently, but definitely you need a team member Q for Quick Capture. So team member S on the Survey123 app um, will be completing two forms the general information form and the trail feature form. Team member Q is using quick capture and they have, it's quite fun if you have watched the video already, but you'll be capturing information on the trail location and you'll be collecting, I think waypoints every nine meters along the trail location. And you're gonna be collecting slope information and trail surface information and any barriers and obstacles on that trail. And every every four, five, sorry, every five meters. Every five meters. Wait, I think you changed wait, it. Wait, wait. Five <laughs> to five. Five meters. Good. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. And if you have a third person, I we're calling him the hawk, and they're quite important as well because they, well, you're busy playing that apps and using the apps. You might miss things. So the third person, big responsibility can be just making sure nothing isn't noticed. That's important for the assessment of the trails. 
so this is something we always need to discuss with any project, you know, whether it's a citizen science project like this or something else, and that is your safety and the safeties of others. So I, I make a point of putting some kind of a slide in everything. Teams are always good in the field because that gives you um, protection. If something goes wrong, there's a support system there. But also just this whole project doesn't work as well with one person. Um, ice and snow, you can tell we wrote this protocol in the winter. Um, we don't think we have any place left in Ontario, not even on the St. Mary's River where we're dealing with ice and snow anyways. But particularly with something like this, when we have diverse teams, you want to make sure you're not on the trail on the ice and the snow. Um, Watch out for barriers. There may be things stopping you on the trails, and that's okay. If you can't get any farther, you can't get any farther. You stop. Human safety issues, you need to feel safe on the trail, and I have some information in the protocol to make sure that that's considered. We are in spring in Ontario. We have ticks, so you need to take tick precautions. Um, use deed on the ankles. Keep your clothing tucked in. Um, tick checks when you come home. If the big, best way to prevent ticks is to stay in the center of the trail, quite frankly. If you stay away from the grasses, you're much easier off. Some areas have predators. Some areas have spring bears. So all those things must be considered when you make up your decisions to survey and how you want to handle your route. Thunderstorms. If you hear thunder, you leave the trail, period. We do, we have, this data is not important enough to be out there in a lightning strike. And finally, it's not my choice whether it's safe to serve or not. It's each team member's individual choice. So you all decide on your own if you feel safe. If you don't feel safe, you don't go in there and survey. That's, that's, that's the bottom line is I'm not there. I can't make the decision for you. So I'm trusting you all to make good choices in the field. So personal team safety this is a difficult talk it always is but teams must talk and work together at the same token we all have different levels of privacy and safety that we must respect and so we are leaving it to the teams to decide how they want to contact each other you can use phones you can use email you can use just a discord which might give you another level of privacy you can choose to carpool if you wish, but if team members prefer to drive themselves, that's completely acceptable as well. If you at any point feel your safety is beyond that and you're not comfortable in the situation of the team, then please contact Jack or myself. Always know you could reach out if you're not comfortable in the team situation. So survey overview, what are we gonna discuss here today? We're going to start, talk about the setting up and a bit about the trail assessment and the, uh, and the quick capture and sending in the data. So we have these 12 hotspots that we've chosen for priority locations. Um, and we know there's trails on them. We've got that already and they're on the maps. Um, and we know that no trail will be perfect. But our goal, as we were discussing with Christy earlier, uh, is to provide the data so that the end user can decide if they want to try that trail or not. And most hotspots, I think all hotspots, have multiple trails identified. To the point in some of these areas, you might say, I don't know how my team is going to get all this done. And chances are you're not going to get all of it done. Um, so we recommend that you start with the most obvious choices of trail the ones that's closest to you or the most popular or the one that looks like it's the best accessibility from the parking lot. And then just move forward on a prioritized list of trails that works for the team. Try to hit at least one really good hotspot where you know everybody likes to bird. The more, the better. I really like to mention the importance of the car pull off options. Um, myself, I go up birding a lot with my father who has mobility issues he just likes sitting in the car and having me driving him around at different spots he says go there and look and go there and look and go there and look so we can't undervalue those spots um, especially since you're a little higher in the car so you can see a lot better so if you know that this car pull off take the time to survey, survey them um, they're important make sure they're included try not to 
bias assessments with your lived experience. Try to make sure you assess everything thoroughly, um, even if you're not too sure of it. Like let the, the people using the map and the analysis and the mapping program do the hard work. Just collect data and collect data as thoroughly as possible. Cardin is mostly car pull offs. Yes, yeah, the same thing I think with St. Mary's River. I think it's got a lot of car pull offs as well. So, the general information map app is the first app you work with. And what it's designed is that when you arrive at a location, no matter how you arrive, we're trying to be very cognizant of public transportation in this project, which and that's also why we have a lot of them in Toronto, because there is good public transportation there. Um, so you arrive to the location, to the gate closest to the public transit, to where the bus drops you off, where the, what have you, and that is your arrival point. And that's when you start to work. And first thing you do is you complete the general information form in the survey one, two, three, HAP. Um, and that'd be the team S person. And that's all about all the information in the arrival location. And then you save it to this out box to submit once you have a Wi-Fi connection. And when you get to Wi-Fi, you submit it by hitting send. So survey one, two, three, you have to check when you've done your work and you have to send it later after you save it. So you check, you save, you send. If you do not check, if you do not save, if you do not send, you may lose data. So that's one of the things you guys have to work with and make sure you're comfortable with. Now we have a little video. All right, I'm gonna stop my share screen. Let me just get the video going here. Um, share sound. Um, you guys give me a, a heads up when you see this. I will show you how to collect yep. data using RTIS Survey 123, General Information App. Select Continue without signing in. Select Enable Building General Information Box. Then Collect. The first question is about a date and time. By default, it recorded the current date, but you can uh, change it at any time by mm. selecting this box. Mm. Uh, next is your name. In this section, you have to type your name. Next, the starting point. Click on the map. Here's my location. The starting point is meant to be the arrival point. Every location has from one to several access points connected to the trails around the periphery of the location to survey. These starting points can be a parking lot, oops, I think I shut it off, guys, bus stop, or a road access point. Now I am in a parking lot. I'm going to switch to the aerial imagery, zoom in into my location. This is one parking lot. Then to submit by location, select the check mark. Location name is Duntas Valley and Duntas Marsh. I select that option. A possible building from a car, a, a car pull off area, no. A biking access from residential? Yes. Uh, I will describe uh, the access is from Old Wealth Road. Bike racks available? Yes. On a street permit parking? No. Parking lot available? Yes. Number of parking lot spaces? I counted 20. Is there any designated access parking lot spaces to visitors with disabilities? Yes. How many? There are four. A parking lot fee? Yes, there is a parking lot fee. And the cost is $5 one hour to $15 all day. 
an electric vehicle charging station in parking area? I didn't find any, so I select no. Parking lot surface is paved. Uh, the parking lot surface condition is well maintained in other seasons. I'm not sure about in winter. The location of an adjacent parking lot. And you can add as many as you want. It is the adjacent parking lot. I center it and again hit the check mark to submit this location. As you see, there is a plus sign and you can add more than one location. Okay, this is the other adjacent parking lot. Submit that the location. Public transit access to the site? No. Is site entrance free? I'm going to move this yes. forward a little bit. Is the a special visitor programs? Yes. Uh, the type of interpretative programs that I found are nature interpretative. It's, it's a nature interpretative center. A special visitor services? Well, Royal Botanical Gardens provides services to persons with disabilities if requested. Other information that I collected is that garden access is partially accessible. Service animals are permitted. Persons with disabilities uh, pay full general admission to gardens and one attendant will assist you. Well, chairs are available, but the, the number is limited. So once I completed the survey, always please don't forget to hit that check mark to submit your survey. I am using now my mobile data, so I select send now. You guys notice how quickly that sent the data? It's not a lot of collection on any one of these forms. So it's not um, um, not much effort to um, send that information. Now, we do have three of these videos. Um, so if you guys have all watched them, let me know because um, it may allow for more time for questions. If you haven't, let me know that as well. So next up is we're talking about the surveying. And surveying involves two apps, two team members. Team S person uses a, um, the um, survey one, two, three trail assessment form. And team Q uses a quick survey capture app. So the um, the normal process is um, you go into the site, you take the time and you do all the work about the site and be detailed on the general information form about the parking lot, because it's pretty clear when you read the literature, it's the parking lot that decides when people move forward, how much information they have before arrival and at arrival. And then you go onto the trails and you do your t and you do the trail assessment and you do the quick capture data collection. And um, when you do the trail assessment, you're looking at main trail features like bathrooms and benches, gates, players, all anything, anything that's relevant, that's different, that's signage, that's useful to know on that trail, then you put it in. Like it, it's a layer that people can just click on buttons and learn. So it's very important. The more information you have there, the more powerful it is. Um, and then the the um, Team Q collects the slope and the trail path and any obstacles on that trail, which is actually the easier job. It's the easier job. Um, Kaylee, do we have many people have seen the video or should I at least start with this next one to show a little bit about it? Um, I have a couple that's just 
in the video, as he does have a question about trends or tactics, if you want to take a look. Well, if you, well, why don't we cover the questions first, and then we'll go on to the next video. Yeah, so um, Tommy Thompson, which is the park that I'm going to be looking at, um, has like a bus stop about, I don't know, 750 meters um, from the parking lot. So I, I'm inclined to think that's not accessible. But there's also a wheel trans in Toronto, um, which I think would probably drop somebody uh, at the location. So I guess I'm just not sure whether that counts as accessible or not. If it, relying on wheel trans, is that... Well, I think a lot of people will be relying on real trans, but that's only one form of disability that would use it. I would purposely go back and consider you having two arrival points. So this is something else we had to discuss. You have to evaluate how many arrival points to we have at a stop. And I've been told before Tommy Thompson has one, but now you've just clearly said that we have the bus arrival point. So you have one assessment of that and then 750 meters at another location, you'd have the regular parking lot. So you would like, the trail assessment on the trail only needs to be done once, but ideally, or not ideally, we need arrival point assessment at all arrival points. So literally, if you have a spot, you can get there by subway and by go train and by bus and by car, that's four arrival points probably unless they all converge into one single parking lot. Yeah, there, yeah there's really only one access point. It's like, yeah. well, actually, I guess there are two, but yeah. Yeah. Um, the second one isn't really, I, I think, feasible for, well, I don't know, I'll have to think about that. Whether the I think, one. I don't think you should decide it's feasible. I think you should assess it and trail capture it from there to the door of the right. gate. Right, but there's still the question of, of whether it's transit accessible or not. I, I don't know, maybe this is too detailed a question for the group, so. Um, remember, yeah. remember again that disabilities come in many ways, shape and forms. Like somebody who has a visual disability may use that. Somebody who has an anxiety disorder and does not want to drive in Toronto, like, okay, that's half the population. Okay, maybe right, this, that's talking about problem. mobility only, right? Yeah, no, well, it's fair to do that. If it's easy enough to do that, and it's not gonna cost a lot of time, do the assessment. Any arrival points should be assessed. Let's just start with that um, and, and go from there. And very much, you may need to do an assessment of a trail capture from there to the regular gate entrance. And I think it's a value, but that's a really good question. Okay, so this is a short video and I think it's helpful. So we'll watch it. You will not have a Wi-Fi connection. So I will turn off my Wi-Fi and mobile data to imitate. Oops, sorry, guys. The conditions in the field. And within the survey one, two, three app, and now you can see that your device is offline. Signing in, please. For the sake of saving time, I have collected seven records in Hyde Park. You can see my outbox. I have seven uh, records. Uh, but let's collect one more record together. Mm -hmm. You are working in Hyde Park. But now you will recommend a bench. Mm -hmm. Imagine that you, you've been walking on a trail and you have to stop to catch your breath, but there is no benches around. Then this is the best location to recommend a, a bench. You can either write in the notes why you are recommending a bench or record it. This time I will record it. Tap to start recording. Last bench was far away. Need a bench here to rest. Mm -hmm. Tap again to the red symbol to stop to stop a, a recording. Next, tap on the map to locate the proposed bench. You are in train number four. Switch to base map 
to aerial imagery. And zoom in to make sure the location is correct. Make the adjustments. Tap the check mark to submit your location. And again, tap the check mark to submit your, your recommendation. Now, select Save to Outbox. Close everything. Once you have time, you can come back to open the app and send your, and send your surveys. Make sure you have a Wi-Fi connection and turn off your mobile data. As a hint, you can see the number 8 on the Trail Assessment app and in the Outbox. Select the Outbox. This is the list of your records. And in the bottom, you see the Send icon. Tap on it. It's sending the, the results. As you see, the outbox has disappeared, meaning you submitted successfully your results. And a send icon indicates the number of records that you submitted. Okay, there's several things we can unpack with this. First, you notice the consistent use of that checkbox that you manually have to send your records if you work off data, offline. Um, and Sandra has just mentioned that she's changed the location question. It isn't there anymore. So you don't have to enter the location every time you enter data. Um, one point I'd like to make, I was using this in the field three nights ago and I did not bother to upload my base maps because I didn't plan. So I couldn't access base maps, but it automatically gave me a coordinate point as well. Where I was, I knew that it would be accurate because it was all open area. There was nothing that could impact the, the level of location quality. So I was comfortable doing that, but that's something to keep in mind. If you don't have that um, underlying base map. You can put the data in, but you may not be as confident with the precision of the data. Um, it's already, how many people, again, Kaylee, how many people do you think watch? No, you will not have a Wi-Fi connection, so I will turn off. Okay, what page am I on here? Uh, this I one. have two in the chat that can people. Okay, we might, I might leave the quick I might start the quick capture video for you guys, but I'm not going to watch the whole thing for you. Um, is there any other questions, Kaylee, that relate to what we've seen so far? I hope that was everything. Okay. So let's just start this so you get some idea of what it looks With like. With RTIS Quick Capture, a field data collection app, you can capture data simply and quickly. It was designed to support field teams that need to rapidly collect data from a moving vehicle, a bicycle, motorcycle, all-terrain vehicle, and if the trail surface allows it, a wheelchair. This app works perfectly fine offline. While in field, make sure uh, your mobile data is off. If you have not done so already, sign in using the credentials provided. Open Quick Capture by selecting this box. You are in Carton Alvar, select that option, and you will survey uh, trade number five. Then select on. Check that the location you enter is correct, Cardinal. Okay. Waypoints. The first thing you have to do is stand at the trailhead. Then <clears throat> tap. Start recording waypoints. Tap recording waypoints. Look at the trail and select the best option that describes the width and surface of the trail. 
let me explain more. The recording waypoints function will collect continuous points of coordinates and elevation every two meters. Please always walk or ride any small vehicle in the middle of the trail when possible. Keep it on all the time until finishing that survey. Uh, the width of the trail is grouped into three categories. Wide trails, more than two meters, medium trail, one to two meters, and narrow, less than one meter. On every group of width, there are seven options to collect the surface of the trail. Paved, boardwalk, gravel, soil, grass, mulch, other. Every time you notice a change in the width and surface type of the trail, you have to tap the option that better describes that particular trail segment. Let's imagine you are about to start collecting data. By standing on the trailhead, turn on the recording waypoint and a voice will confirm you have started recording waypoints. Start recording waypoints. Please leave it on until the end of your trail survey. Then look at your trail and select the surface type according to the width of the trail. Start paved. Every time you see that, that the surface or the width of the trail changes, select the option that describes it. Start boardwalk. Please always focus your attention on observing any change in surface and width. If you see an obstacle such as gates, get closer to the object, to the ob obstacle. Take a picture. Remember, always hit the check mark to submit your new obstacle. Your obstacle. Oop. I'm going to move forward with that just because I'm going to go back to that page, though, um, just because we are going to run out of time. Um, and I think that was enough to see how fantastic this little app is. So with this one app and a single person going down the center of the line, we can track so that everybody can know how wide the trail is, the surface of the trail, the slope of the trail. We can take pictures of potholes and gates and, and ridges on the trail. There's a lot to unpack with this. And eventually we'll end up with a map that shows all these features so you can tell what the width is and when it gets too narrow for you and when it's nice and wide and what potential barriers are. And then um, you can move forward with that. So definitely take the time and, and look those over. Unfortunately, not everybody will get access to that app because it's a very special app. Um, I, where at this point, we're hoping to have one login per team and they will get to look at it. Um, but we can't undervalue how important that data is. And, all, and remember though, you gotta remember to push the button, the recording button, push the button, take a picture, Check marks, don't undervalue check marks, they're important here. And um, when you're all done this, you don't, you have to sign, not sign off, but you have to um, close down the app or else it continues to work. This app will just keep going in the background unless you shut it off. All right, so we need to talk about sending the data. Um, so once you have collected all this data, um, you send it. How do you send it? You can send it while you're on site, as shown in um, the Survey123 app, it has a send button. Um, for quick capture, you've already closed off the app. 
So what you need to do is when you get back, depending, uh, Sandra knows this better than I do, some systems automatically send it. Other ones, you have to double check and look for a, a button that says send in the top right-hand corner and make sure it's sent. Um, I think the biggest thing that makes or breaks that one is whether you log out or not. So when you close down the app, don't log out and double check later. So you just make sure your data is sent either manually or automatically when you're back on data. Double check and to make sure it was hit, it's now sent. Um, the person with the Team Q person can actually go into the maps and double check to see if your data is there. And if you have concerns about having some data go up, um, um, you can ask them to check for you. And just so that you know, it's just because of the quick, the 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 quick capture data has to be kept private so um because of um esri rules so that's why we're limiting the number of people access to the data capture map um you can always if you want call me and we can do a screenshot and i can show it to you um, we just can't make the maps public without a login and that's it so it's a lot of work it's a lot of detailed work but it looks very very simple on paper so what about problems can you run into? Both Sandra and I feel that glare is a big issue. Um, so make sure your back is to the glare. Um, perhaps wear a big floppy hat. You can stick the app under. Um, find out what works for you. We can just have every team member out there with a the pinafore if you'd like. Um, it would be quite cute. Um, pinafore. Is that right? The little sun, sun umbrellas? Um, batteries are the concern. You might want to take a battery pack with you. Make sure you shut off your data so you're not wasting it on this project. We don't expect people to use expensive data. Um, check those check marks is the other one. And the next thing is finding your trail map. And I'm going to, I believe, go over that with you. So what about trails that are in different formats and shape? So this trail is probably the most complicated one that I have seen. Um, and that's the Rosetta McLean. And I think what all you have to do is remember where you've been. And maybe you want to have actually a paper copy of a map with you on that one and cross off maps as you go. I believe they're numbered. And by tracking the numbers on that map, you can track which trails you have done. But we thought about what's the best procedure for one-way loops, one-way trails, trail loops, car pull-offs, long trails, or visiting more than once. And this is our suggested protocol from the, from the protocol. One-way trails, we suggest that you do your main capturing, trail capture, and survey one to three from the arrival point, and everything is about the arrival point in, from the arrival point to the end point. Then you can shut off quick capture and on the way back, you can just look for things you've missed and maybe use the trail assessment app to put in more things that you let miss. Now trail loops, ones that have a beginning and it goes back around to the same place where it ends, those are a little bit different. You would just go around the trail once, so you just have to be more aware of concerns on that trail. Car pull-offs, you would use a general information app. If there's any important features to collect, you'd use a trail assessment app. And if possible, if it's long enough, like I know some of the car pull offs at Long Point, it's the length of two cars. But if it's possible, do a short, quick capture of that location as well. Long trails. Um, the reality is, most trails, I believe, the, the average is under. Um, a kilometer, but we do have some long trails in the system and I would segment it up. Um, pick an area, survey that, survey the most accessible areas first. You obviously long trails if you're gonna do the whole thing, if it's realistic, it may not be realistic, you're gonna visit it more than once. And then the data can be, um, for lack of a better term, stitched together on in, during the processing end. But just always make sure that whatever you and your team decide to do, you use a consistent approach so that nothing is missed in your assessments. So this is what I drew this picture in. This is my house. Um, and this is me using the two apps combined. So this is the data on me walking around my front yard and my backyard um, using 
the quick capture um, and the green, the green lines are the quick capture collection of my data. And wherever you see the caution marks is where I decided there was a change in the um, trail, fake or right, I did a lot of changes, uh, whether I thought there was a barrier. So it, this is what the data ends up looking like. So obviously with data we have of this project, when you first look at it, you can say, oh my God, that's ugly. And it is ugly. But this is where we have our GIS guru, Sandra, and she will, we hope to survey everything by about June 15th, then she takes over. She lets us know if we need any reassessments. Hopefully we won't. Um, and the goal is to get the big map, interactive map up and functioning in a realistic manner by fall migration. So we have a timeline here, which is why we're fairly tight right now at the same token. We all have busy lives. We don't need this to run all summer. We all have other things to do. Um, so that gives you an idea on how it works. Tips and troubles, um, offline versus online. So you can do both. You can use your Wi-Fi and you can use the data if you choose to, but it will use data. Um, when you leave Quick Capture, make sure you close everything out. Make sure when you're back online that it does send. Um, um, you need to have someone take a look at your uploads and make sure they're uploaded and they know where they go. So they maybe you have some ones that you can tell them to look for specifically to make sure that the uploads are there. Now, the most important buttons in the whole system are the check marks. For qu quick capture, it's recording waypoints. If you do not hit that recording waypoint button, you're just taking a nice walk. Um, or a nice stroll or a nice travel down a trail, however it means you do it. Uh, location is an absolute. You're going to find it's required for everything. And that's because we're tying it all back to the maps. Um, and as long as you're checking the buttons, hitting the buttons, not forgetting to hit that button in the quick capture when the trail changes, we're good. Now, no route, no, no routes, um, better routes, um, or no, no routes. We're not perfect, right? We can't do everything. We can't access everything. We are going to make errors, and we're going to find things six months down the road. We're going to wish we had surveyed. That's just how it works with pilot projects. Um, what if you find a new route that is not in the system? No, oh, that's important. It's okay to track it. Sandra has recommended that you start it at a number of 100 because every um, map is, is, is got a number associated with it. Um, so she says start it at a trail number of 100 or greater and just for all the new routes you find or new trails you find, just put 100, 101, 102 so far. Um, and then you just assess it as you would any other route or any other trail. What if you find a trail you believe is better than the ones that are on your priority list? Well, if it fits and everybody agrees with you, then assess it. Um, what about better routes and better birds and areas outside of our pilot locations? But that's gonna happen. Everybody wants, we're, we're starting to get quite a list of people who want to become involved and want their trails assessed. We only have so much time and money and people, right? So. Right now, Jack is collecting a list of locations for future um, trail assessments. We also, the new feedback app has an opportunity for you to put things you think you should be assessed in there as well. And remember not to undervalue the hidden gems, those picnic areas, the harbors where you can see um, lots of ducks and lots of gulls, beach parking lots. Like, I mean, who hasn't gone, gone and had lunch at the beach so they can watch gulls. Uh, perhaps that's just something somebody like me does, but I mean, that's fun. Um, any parking lots from the Nature Conservancy and places like that and land trust where you can sit and you can bird from the car. Um, any place like that is a great birding spot. So don't undervalue them. Old roads. How many old roads and unassumed roads are used for birding? Uh, a lot. So those can be considered trails as well. And you can even do your trail capture from the car, as long as you make a comment that that's how it's being done. Um, so we gotta um, consider those. 
as well. We have suggested that if you do go on an unassumed or this road is not maintained, when you're doing a trail assessment, remember to take a photo of that sign that says this road is not maintained, and then that can go right in the system as well. Um, I feel like we didn't go over our route priorities. Um, so that's something we can do the next training session. So next steps, who to contact. Try to do a dry run before Wednesday night when we do the next meeting. So the work next workshop is Wednesday night at 7.30. We want to have the assessments completed by June 15th. And you can confirm your assessments are completed by emailing the enabled at ofo.com. Com, com, dot ca, dot ca email. I get it wrong every time, don't I, Jack? Um, so, yeah, there, I get it right. So you can contact Jack and I at enabled at ofo.ca. We got the Discord set up and some people have joined it. So that's another way to communicate with people. We can do virtual one-on-ones. In the evenings are probably best and we have workshop three coming up. And if Kathy and Jack cannot answer your question, we're going to lean heavily on Sandra in those situations as well. Um, so I have not left any time to talk, but I'm going to put up one picture and I'm going to say, what do you guys think? Is this a good birding spot? Is this an accessible birding spot? And I'm going to stop screen sharing um, and just let you know that to have a quick look at that, I'm going to stop screen sharing and then we can chat. Um, so, questions, comments. The tiny URL asks for a login, you're right, Chris, because that goes to the quick capture map. So, we, that's the one we have to keep private. So, you won't be able to get into that until later. Um, any questions, anyone? I have a question. Um... I actually have two questions, if that's okay. I yep. the first one is about um, one of the videos we watched, where um, it, we have the abil ability to recommend features, um, because so much of our framework is to not ha assume any type of um, particular disability or needs. How are we meant to like know where, for instance? Uh, we would recommend a bench or like if there's it seems like oh a washroom is far away like how far away is too far away well we purposely tried and it's been difficult because we only have so many people we purposely tried to have teams that have different lived experiences and you've all done the four for five questions where you learn what other people are looking for so I think it's reasonable to say that if you feel like we need something here it's okay to recommend it it may yeah. never like this is um, an option that we're putting out there for future consideration for parent owners, right? There's no guarantee we're going to make a difference with this. But I know for one, for, for a great example, um, and it never even occurred to me. I went birding with my father at the Port Rowan wetlands, which some people may know. And it's got this massively long ramp that goes up that he can handle. But he gets to the top and the one day, Last year, he looked over and said, oh, look, there's a bench there. I've always wanted a bench there because this is such a long trail. So just in itself, if there's a platform, can't that platform have a bench? Um, talk to the team. If everybody's aware and they think it's something that's useful, put it in. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. And I do have another question if it's okay. Yes. I know we're short on time. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I remember you say, maybe it was in the first session though, um, the importance of, and, and difficulties of slopes. And I, no I noticed there's a couple links in the protocol, but it all seems to be um, deter like reliant on your ability to measure like the height of the slope versus, versus where the slope starts, which makes sense for a man-made slope. But like, how do you do that, say like on a forested trail? The, you don't do that. Quick Capture does. Quick okay, Capture, it does it automatically. It does it automatically, okay. which is one Good. of the things that okay, I really, you. it makes it, it I'm enough of a data nerd to that when I said, oh, it's just collecting slope and distance and everything else. And that will all end up in the app. So you're collecting that information without realizing it. With that said, if it's a short space, like a short ramp, it's going to be, if it's within that five meters, 
it may not be identified as a slope by quick camp captured. So we have to do our dil due diligence and make sure things like ramps and things like that are identified by slope. And when you look at the trail assessment app, um, it gives you the option of less than 5% and, and over 10% or less than 10%. I mean, if it's a ramp over 10% it's useless pretty much. Um, it can be used for, I don't know, racing cars. Um, <laughs> but, um, and we give you some small guidelines and other ways you could do it you can do things like um you can get level apps for your phone that'll tell you what the slope is if you don't want to do calculations some people can like my father i know he'll look at it and say oh yeah that's five percent it's like how do you know that dad and it's just because he worked in construction a lot um and just find what suits you best. There is a lot of apps out there. There's a bubble app for the Androids and there, I think there's level apps for both Androids and and and, and um, I think Apple might even have a built-in bubble-like app if I remember what I was reading. So just find what works for you when it comes to measuring slope. Uh, thank you. Just, it, it, I just, just would like to add, quick capture is gonna, when you hit that waypoints uh, option, you are going to collect three pieces of information, elevation, latitude, and longitude. So based on this information, I can derive the slope of the trail only. But for example, in platforms, there are ramps. So what Kathy mentioned, these kind of apps are going to be very useful because cap a quick capture won't uh, provide that information because of at this point, because exactly, okay. exactly, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Now it's it's one fifty eight. We have no right to keep you longer, and I have no right to keep Sandra and Kaylee and Jack longer. But if people have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Kaylee, do we have any questions online that we need to approach? Um, we have one from Andrew. So the first part is. What are the numbers on the trail maps? For example, Pesco goes up to number 63. Good question. I'm going to share a trail map. Um, let um, me just find it. Well, um, if the numbers are the trail numbers, uh, do I capture 63 trails or can they be combined? Um, the, the, the 63, those are the, the um, it's an identifier number of the trail. It's just a number. But by putting that in, if it requests it, it allows you to identify what the trail is. The biggest thing is you can cross those numbers out since you can complete the trail and then you know what's done. But um, we have not gone into the trail maps very much. So I'm gonna see if I can pull one up here and share with you guys. And I'm gonna just do, I'm yeah, gonna just do an easy one. That up, um, yep. I'm just gonna add for the group, there was a document or the protocol document, um, just for people who are asking about the QR codes, it looks like they're on page 24 of the protocol document. So if you haven't scanned those into your survey app yet, uh, that's where you can find them. And those, the ones in there are the good quality ones. One of the reasons I have not pulled the survey app QR codes up here is you need to have a good quality one. So um, let me see if I can get this bit bigger here. Probably I can't. There we go. Um, if you look, you'll see this is <laughs> this is a, an easy one, yet it isn't. This is Luther Marsh, so it looks like it's only two trails listed. Um, those trails are actually old roads, um, and they're very long ones. So it, there's a um, a code for every trail, and they're just to track whether you get done. It it could be fairly safe to say that you don't do these whole trails in one day. They're fairly long, and you may find like I'm seeing some white roads listed there that are not considered trails and you may want to consider evaluating those as well. Kaylee, what was Kathy? the other half? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kathy, it's Jack, Jack here. Yep. So maybe I can help a little bit with Andrew's question. Um, yeah, it's true that at a place like Presqu'Isle, there are 63 trails that have been designated and you also get a large number of trails that Tommy Thompson and at Point Peely and so on. Um, those trails should be done individually. You may, at Presqu'Isle, you may not do all 63, you know, going back to Kathy's point earlier about sort of prioritizing. I know for a fact, um, 
that not all of them are going to be as important from a birders or nature lovers perspective. Um, but I hope that answers the question, Andrew. Now, it did end up in the final talk, but there is a page in the protocol about prioritizing a trail. And we'll see if I remember it right, because I could get it wrong, and you can all tell me later. You start with the ones that are clearly accessible. They look accessible. And they look accessible. You make that decision in the parking lot as what is accessible. And then you go to the ones that look at the parking lot like they might be accessible, but you're not entirely sure. And then after, if you manage to get through those two big lists, you can start looking at the less accessible options. So we would love to see every single trail assessed, but we're not going to get there. And there's going to be trails that some team members cannot go on all the way. And that's another important point. If you cannot go any farther on that trail for one reason or another, that's it. The trail's done. The assessment's done on that trail. And I think another consideration when deciding which trails to do is um, which ones are most likely to be used by birders or nature lovers. And in some cases, we've designated roads that are really not that significant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any more questions, Kaylee? Oh, I don't have any more in the chat. Is anyone? Oh, sorry, one more from Steve. Uh, how can you try out oh, quick capture without access? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like you've said that. Yeah, we have to wait till we get access, right? The the, the Q team members yeah. needing get access, and then, but, but I. I feel like you were suggesting that we should try out the quick capture, but I'm I'm a little confused because we can't, right? You I can't. You can't. So you're going to have that on short notice. Frankly, as long as you remember to hit the recording button and you do your check marks and you send, make sure it sends, you should be okay. We'll get those to you as soon as we have the team sorted, sure. which is okay. a, it, it's a reality of it. And yeah. not everyone would be able to use it. So take advantage of those um, um particular recordings as well and that's just the reality of, of um property integrity rights there we can't do anything else with that unless we have logins for a person we can't share that information sure anything else all right i'm going to just end this with one image i want to share and we'll let people have a quick conversation on whether they think this is a good trail or not. Um, let me just find it here. And um, I was out walking in my favorite marsh. And I took these images. And so speak up, folks. Let me know whether you think this is likely to be a good trail based on that. Any thoughts? Does that look like a good parking lot? I would estimate, Kaylee knows where it is. <laughs> she knows it's my favorite trail. I would estimate it holds maybe five cars. It's funny how it looks longer with the with the, with the um with the um the the way it's envisioned there. Um it's a rough gravel. Uh, there are no amenities. There's no parking fees. It's in the middle of nowhere, so there's no accessible busing. There is quite, actually, I don't know about that. There is an accessible bus. that There's a bus that comes down to this area through Norfolk County. But I would think you'd have quite a long travel length from the bus stop to here. So, um, and I'll see if I can send some, this is the other side of the trail. Oop, that's my house. You guys don't need to see that. Um, so that's the other side of the trail. So now you're starting to see a few things. What we do on this trail to give you, it's just some ideas for thoughts. So you can see it's very rough gravel. I can't tell you whether that's easy to, to, to travel with. I know my mother would try it in a scooter. She would go anywhere on a scooter though. Um, and you'll notice that it has fantastic views, which we often do when we bird, is we take the, the Jeep and we angle it in different places in this parking lot and we look. And from there, you can see gulls, you can see 
bald eagles, you can see hawks, you can see bitterns and rails, things like that. So um, I'm just curious if um, oh, there I is no. Ask, are there any benches along the trail? Maybe parking lot? No, there's there's no. Benches. No, this is a management zone for duck hunting. So it is a completely unassumed trail. They put no effort in to, to um, protecting it or into taking care of it. And as we get farther down the trail, you see that. So it's, it's a birding trail for long point location. So at this point, it doesn't look bad. Like I think you could readily get a fairly decent item over the, um, onto it because you have a decent space. It's not fantastic, but it's decent. And I took that sign. But there's a lot of these kind of rocks. So I would think in this situation, that would be something you'd want to actually take an assessment up and say, big rocks um, for that decision. And that's what the trail looks like. So there it looks, real. it is Crown Marsh, you're right, Jack. Um, and there have been, and it looks good now. In a month, a third of this trail will be underwater. So it's things like this, like, Shore birding along this location is fantastic, and you can do shore birding from the car. Um, I'm going to just leave this and show you the, the problems with this thing. If they come farther out, where are we here? This is where you stop. And so, in this location, I would recommend a bridge. And I probably never get one, but I'd recommend it because um, it has three of these locations where the, the where it needs um, where the water goes over the road, and it is an old road. So that just gives you an idea about the variety. You can get to this spot in a scooter. I'm pretty sure of it. I'm pretty sure my my mother used to do it all the time. Um, but by providing the distances to these major barriers, it allows people the um, opportunity to make that decision for themselves versus me saying, oh yeah, that trail does not match the AOD standards at all. Because it doesn't, right? Um, there's no way this trail is ever going to be deemed accessible, um, especially with the spring floods. So I just thought I'd, I'd put that out there to, to let people have some idea about the many things we have to look at. And it's 12, it's 210, so we've used up all our time. And we should say goodbye to everybody. But if, if there's any remaining questions at all, Kaylee? Uh, Steve? None in the chat. Did anyone have any? We're good. We're good? OK. Thank you guys so much for attending. Um, we're going to share, Jack is going to share you an email later that will have links to things, including the recordings. And that will go out to everyone. Um, and let us know by email or by the, the feedback app um, if you feel things need to be added or removed from this training, because that's important to know. And um, we didn't do a formal questionnaire for it. And we hope you have fun with the Survey123 app as soon as we get things sorted out on the, the teams. And if your teams get your, your, your stuff together, Sandra, would you rather get all the team logins at once or would you rather do each one at a time? Uh, it doesn't matter. Okay. I, I can do both. I can do it in a group or one by one. It doesn't matter. It doesn't okay. affect at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. So whenever you guys know, let Jack know and we can move forward. Uh, also, Something to keep in mind, if you already use Survey123 and you use a different login for it, you may want to give us a different email for that, just to keep your app a little easier to work with. Um, having everything under one email, one login versus two might be a pain in the butt. Um, and that's it. So I will say thank you all for attending. I hope we haven't overwhelmed you. Jack and I are available for questions. I'm keeping an eye on the Discord as well. And we're very glad you showed up today. Thank you. Okay. Hey, just, uh, just, whoops, just one last thing from me. This is Jack. Um, for those of you who haven't given me permission to share your email address with team members, um, please do so. And you can just send me an email either to my personal email or to enabled, 
with a D, enabled at OFO.ca. And thanks, everyone. See you next time. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Night. <laughs>